I'd like to review some of the elements of doing distortion in Equalizer. The first question is, why do we have to adjust for distortion period? So if we look at this image here, we can see that in a regular lens, all the straight lines are straight, which is called rectilinear. But all lenses have a certain degree of uh, curvature, and uh, that curvature can really mess us up, and that's called lens distortion. If we look here, a lens that is perfectly straight, where straight lines stay straight, is called rectilinear. So very few lenses are actually rectilinear. Uh, one particular one that seems to be pretty good are the Panavision Spherical Primos, but most of the lenses we use, the anamorphics, the zoom lenses, they can be a little messed up. Okay, so what we have is distortion can change. So right here, we can see this is uh, barrel distortion, or that, and this is pincushion distortion. So this value here is negative, and this is a positive distortion. So we can see here on the Wikipedia page that there's three different kinds of distortion. There's barrel distortion, where lines curve in. There's pincushion distortion, where the lines curve out. And then mush desk distortion, which is a combination of the two of them. So barrel distortion is here. It looks like a barrel. Pin cushion distortion looks like a cushion with the uh, corn is flaring out. Then mustache distortion airs were a combination of the first two. So if we look at equalizer here, we can demonstrate these. So we're going to start off with a classic model. So this here, we've got positive and negative distortion. And then if we look at the quartic distortion, it's similar, except for it only affects the edges of the image. If you have a combination of the two of them, you'll end up with a mustache distortion. So you see here, it's actually curving in and out like the mustache that we saw. So let's go to a little bit more there. So again, this is mustache distortion, and a lot of times you'll see this on zoom lenses because they want to have a combination of, um, uh, you know, it's hard to design a zoom lens, so they'll sort of average out the distortion so it won't be too bad, but it gets a little bit complicated here. So this distortion here is uh, second order, and this one here is fourth order. So if we look at Wikipedia, we see that second order, quadratic, uh, th this is things that you probably learned in junior high school, are equations that have x to the second power. A cubic one is where it has x to the third power, and a quartic is where it has x to the fourth power. But you don't have to understand the math at all. What's important is that quartic, which is uh, second order, sec x to the second power, is a nice, simple, even distortion value, and it's even across the frame. But if you use x to the fourth power, quartic, it mainly affects the edges. And so by using a combination of these two, we can get some sophisticated distortion values. Now, if we look at um, the way that um, PF track works, it has the same values. It has low order distortion, which is x to the second power, it's quadratic, and they have higher order distortion, which is quartic, uh, which is based on x to the fourth power. And they also have anamorphic squeeze, like we have an equalizer, and they have uh, lens centers. Uh, now, equalizer has even more parameters than synthize. Synthize only has second order, and uh, they don't have uh, all these other nice ones in, in PF track. But the parameters are basically the same thing, they're the same Brownian math. Now, you can't actually enter the numbers exactly the same in PF track because they've got some other arithmetic that's slightly different, but basically they're doing the same thing. So we've got this value here. Now, let's uh, backtrack and say, why do we have to adjust distortion? Two reasons. One, if these straight lines aren't straight, that means that you can't get the LiDAR to line up. Any sort of curvature that's in the original photography, the lens has to be removed inside of equalizer, and then it gets added back into the 
uh, render of the CGI elements later. The other issue is that if you don't get rid of lens distortion inside of Equalizer, when these points come to the edge of frame, there'll be a pop because the 2D point and the 3D point have to line up with one another, and only by adjusting the distortion properly can you get that to happen. So we've all seen pops where uh, it comes to the edge of frame, and when this touches here, all of a sudden the entire image has a jerk. And the reason for that is sort of like uh, chairs. So you can have a three-legged chair or table, and you can have a four-legged chair or table. So if you've got a three-legged uh, table in a restaurant, it can never rock. It's always going to sit flat. But if you've got a four-legged table or chair on an uneven surface, it can rock a little bit. And so then the uh, waiter might have to put a, a wedge or something underneath this to keep it from rocking. So we've got the same thing. So you've, most people have been on rocking chairs or rocking tables, and it's a little unnerving. So again, we've got the same thing in tracking softwares, that if the distortion isn't perfect, it's sort of like a four-legged chair or table sitting on an uneven ground. And so then as soon as this goes out of frame, uh, then the entire uh, solve will sort of like rock on the feet here, and you'll get a pop. So uh, most of you already know this, but uh, handling distortion is a very important thing. So this is second order, and this is fourth order. So, and this is on the classic model, which uh, Equalizer Origin came up with around 1994, and in the last few years, they've come up with a bunch of new models that we'll review. So anamorphic squeeze, that makes an adjustment to the regular distortion. So if this value here is zero, then the anamorphic squeeze will have no effect. Anamorphic squeeze actually has nothing to do with anamorphic at all. But as we move this back and forth, you'll see there's no change. All it's doing is it's modifying the squeeze on these other parameters. Now, in addition, we've got curvature X and curvature Y. So we'll see it's stretching the image this way for curvature for X, Y and this will be on the Y. So this model worked pretty well for some years, um, up until around 2010, but then things got more complicated with stereo and with anamorphic, so they had to come up with new models. So this second order and this fourth order, if we go to our newer model, which is a radial one, this distortion second degree and this degree, fourth degree quartic are exactly the same as this distortion and this distortion. They're not sort of the same. You put the exact same values, they'll look exactly the same. So this particular model is intended uh, for more difficult shots, zoom lenses, and also for stereoscopic. So we've got second degree, we've got fourth degree, but then we've got this UV. So the UV is a little bit different than the classic because it's asymmetrical. It's different on the left side of frame to the right side of frame. And right here, this is different on the left side, the right side of frame. Now, again, we can remember that the quartic affects what goes on the edges of frame and not the center. And these here, these fourth degree U and Vs, will adjust the symmetrical left, right, or uh, top, bottom of it. Now, a lot of times, uh, some of our clients won't want us to adjust these. We want them at zero. And the reason for that is that you can get some very weird effects that might be non-plausible that the uh, lens is not actually doing at all. Then the final adjustment for stereo is this here. This is intended for beam splitters. So this is a sort of a skew. And this here, this cylindric direction only has an effect if this value here is non-zero. So right here we see it's doing nothing. But here if that's not zero. So it's doing sort of a trapezoidal um, parallelogram mesmerizer sort of look. So then the uh, the fisheye one's a little complicated. Uh, basically what will happen is that the distortion is dependent on focal length. We won't go into detail on this. But in all of the other models, focal length has no effect on the distortion. But in the fisheye one, it's very much a factor. Uh, the fisheye, you won't see many fisheye lenses we're actually tracking. The main time you'll see it is if you're using a GoPro or something. So we'll move on from fisheye. And now the anamorphic degree 6, this is obsolete. Don't use it. There is no purpose to use it whatsoever. It's been replaced with this one here, which is simpler. 
So if, if you're using anamorphic, then you want the pixel aspect ratio to be 2. And then we can see we've got so standard controls, and some of them are curvature, and some are distortion. And so they're similar to the what you see in the classics and in the uh, newer radial degree 4. And here we've got a mustache distortion. Now the lens rotation, the purpose for this is that if you look at a lens mount, uh, there's a little pin here and a pilot hole. So when the lens, an interchangeable lens goes on the camera, it's positioned correctly so it doesn't rotate. Now, normally it doesn't matter too much if it rotates or not, but if you've got an anamorphic lens, it's very important that it sit properly because if it doesn't sit properly, then the entire image will again will get a trapezoidal feel. So uh, a parallelogram feel to it. Uh, so the lens rotation here is intended to uh, compensate for any misalignments. Like if this pin here is bigger than the pilot hole, there could be some slight rotation. And you could take the lens off the camera, put it back on, and it could change. So the most important factors in anamorphic is the squeeze. So these here are intended to be animated during the shot. Because if we look here, we know that anamorphic lenses breathe. So let's look at this. So here, this is, um, every lens is different in anamorphic. Here, when we've got the lens breathing, it's just moving vertically. But the next lens that's going to come up, it's going to adjust horizontally. And the fact that it's asymmetrical, you can't just re use a regular zooming function, is quite a bit of work uh, with anamorphic. And anamorphic, really, to tell you the truth, should not even be shot. But the uh, director's photography like torturing us with this. So here you notice it's mainly squeezing in X. And on some lenses, it'll squeeze in X and Y at the same time. So that's why we have these factors here, and uh, there's other tutorials that cover this in more detail. Um, so again, the um, anamorphic here has nothing to do with anamorphic. You can put any value you want in there and still have a value of 1 here. But when you do anamorphic, this one here, uh, this value will be at 2. Of course, that looks weird there. And then. Uh, these numbers here for squeeze, you want to be close to one. You can have like 0 0.95 or 1.05. They should be within hopefully around 5% of just being at one. And then you, again, you can animate these with all the lookup tables. So after we've got all this uh, distortion figured out, normally the uh, tools uh, here will um, export the distortion automatically embedded into the MEL script. But at other places, the normal way it's done is that you just export a separate um, wetted distortion node, like this one here. And then you bring it into Nuke manually. But it doesn't matter whether it's manual or automatic. So right here, so classic okay, Nuke. And then we'll bring up Nuke here. So here we have our image. And to get that uh, Nuke node in that's doing the distortion, you can go to Import Script. And then um, we go to, uh, let's see, Document, Rectilinear, and here's the script. Or another way of doing it would be if you go to PF widgets, then you can create these nodes also here, and then you can put the values. So let's take a look at how this working. So we've got a read node, same image that we had before. We'll look at this black outside later, and also this transform later as well, because those are optional. And uh, for what we're doing right now, the transform is also optional. So important thing is, we've got our image. So here we see that there's a distortion value which we can change. 
Now, as we change the distortion, we see the image is going out of frame. Some of our pixels are getting lost. So if we just look at it, here we've got our entire image. But then when we go to this undistort node here, we're losing picture area. But it's very easy to get that back. Notice, of course, now I have this set to undistort. Now, to get that image back, first of all, we want to know is that if you right click in the viewport, you've got a couple buttons here. You've got present, prevent auto zoom and show over scan. So we'll just leave the prevent auto zoom on. And now we're going to go to show over scan. And what happens here is that let's say we've got a 1K image, we can see that those extra pixels actually aren't going away at all. They're actually here all the time, but they're not necessarily going to be rendered, but they are inside the brain of Nuke. Now, we see here that there's some weird pixels. And so what we can do is we use black outside. We can see that those pixels are actually the last pixel here just being stretched up because it's uh, never, never land here. And um, so if we use black outside, instead of it repeating pixels, which is sort of ugly and confusing, it'll put black like we would expect. So we'll just leave that in there. And then, so the image in the center is the same, but so we've got these extra pixels that are past the 1K or past the 2K area. So, but this area here, so by going to show over scan we can see it but it still won't render the only way to get it to render is if we put a third node in here that's a reformat node so with a reformat node right here we'll put a scale of 1.2 uh, for basically for spherical shows and stereoscopic shows this number is set to 1.1 and for anamorphic shows we set to 1.2 and notice also right here it says resize none so it doesn't try to size it uh, it's just adding extra border so here we turn off the overscan. So by using a reformat node, then it uh, tells Nuke to not only allow this to stay inside of its um, brain, inside of RAM, but it actually says, oh, I'm going to render this as well by using the reformat node. So normally when you use track tools and cam and all this stuff is done automatically for you, you'll see it all in the Nuke script that you use when you render. But normally, like I said, this is done for you.